All right, shalom, everybody. Very excited that we are all here. As you guys see, we do have our new church flyers, and we are going to be getting out. We have our challenge, which started yesterday. We are checking in on the memorial blowing of trumpets, but our goal is to double our membership and attendance by the time we go to Tabernacles. We have Tabernacles booked. This year we are going to be going to the White Tank Mountains. It's very beautiful up there. Unfortunately, there is no lake there, but they do have clean and fresh bathrooms and showers. We're going to be having a lot of fun, and that's going to be a great time for learning. So um, that's October 10th through the 17th, and of course the 8th day we will be back here in the uh, church amongst the congregation celebrating the 8th day. So if you have any questions about that, you can see me. Um, today we're going to be talking about what do you believe? Because there's a lot of crazy people out there believing a lot of crazy stuff. They believe in bunnies and rabbits and all kinds of crazy things. White guys who climb down your chimney and instead of stealing stuff, they give you stuff. They believe in that crazy stuff. This, here's one that a lot of people believe in and they're not even aware. Um, we were driving. Christy and I, we just came back from a mini vacation. And I said, see that sign? Because we were driving next to the coast and there was a sign that said sea level. And I said, the sea level proves the shape of the earth because the sea level will always rise to the horizon. The horizon is always a straight line no matter where you look at it in the whole world. Sea level is when you are at the same level as the sea. Now we went up like 4,000 you know, feet elevation. We came back down to sea level. How come the water doesn't rise to 4,000 feet elevation? There's no such thing. There is a such thing everywhere in the world. It's called sea level and it is the same height everywhere you go. So there are a lot of crazy things that people believe in. Today we are going to analyze this word believe. Now this is what's interesting, the word believe in Hebrew is pronounced amen. It's the amen, it's the exact same letters that are used for you to say amen. Now in ancient Hebrew, there is no E, so they're both the same word. To say believe, and to say amen are the same thing. So if you say something and I say amen at the end of it, I'm saying, yeah, I believe that. Let that be established, let it be confirmed. This word means to build up or support. Figuratively to render or be firm, faithful, trust or believe. To be permanent, morally certain or true. There's a, a lot of meanings for this word, amen. Okay, let's take a look at the first mention of this word believe. Give me Genesis chapter 15 and let's take a look at verse 6. Who do you guys think the first person to believe was? Jesus. Where do you get that from? Who was the first person to believe? Abraham was the first. This is the first mention of this word believe. Now, if you're using your Strong's app and you hold your finger down on the word, you're going to see that this word is pronounced amen. Okay, it's not amen, but if you look at the Hebrew characters, the Aleph, the Mem, and the Nun, it's the exact same letters that are used to make up amen, and they technically mean the same thing. The scripture says, and he, that's Abraham, what did he do? He believed in Yahweh, and he, Yahweh, counted it to him for righteousness. See, Abraham made a choice to believe what Yahweh said. And that's the place where we're all at. We should be making a conscious choice to believe what he said. You don't have to believe what dad said, or well, you should, but you don't have to believe what mom said. If she, what she's saying goes against the scriptures, you need to believe what Yahweh says. Here's an important one. You don't even need to believe what you say about yourself. Because a lot of us are saying negative stuff. You wake up and you're like, oh, I'm getting old. Look at all these gray hairs, right? We, I'm broke. We say all these terrible things. Do you really believe that about yourself? Because what you believe is what you're going to receive. That's what you're going to see show up in your life. Only what you believe. Now take a look at Abraham. Righteousness showed up in his life because the scripture says he believed. He believed in Yahweh and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God 
and he didn't just say he believed, he actually did something to prove it. Now, most people think that what Abraham did to prove that he believed was what? What does most people think? That he was willing to sacrifice his son. That's not what the scripture says he did to, to prove that he believed. Give me Genesis 26 verse 5. Yes, he did, and he was willing to sacrifice his son. But watch, the scripture says, because that Abraham, here it is, obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is what he did to demonstrate that he believed it. <laughs> I, got, I got to get it in. Can I watch this? His faith was proven by what he was willing to do. Now, the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his son, his, the scripture calls him his only begotten son. But was that his only begotten son? No, he had another son named Ishmael who was born first. Why is the Bible calling Isaac his only son and his only begotten son? He's the only son to whom the promise was made. That made him the only begotten son. All right, now watch this. Give me James chapter 2, verse 21, because we see to believe is to demonstrate faith, but you cannot do it without actually being willing to put your hand to the plow and do some work. James chapter 2, verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? That's a question. What's the answer? Yes. Yes, Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar. Give me verse 22. The scripture says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? What does wrought mean? It means worked. See how faith worked with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Are you able to see that? Because see, there's a question mark there at the end. It says, are you able to see how you need to do something in order to prove that you believe? Let me verse 23 it says and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed what does the word imputed mean it means counted that means it was counted to impute we think of it as compute <laughs> to compute to impute is to put that within it was put into him Scripture says it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So what does that mean? First you believe, then you do something because you believe, and then you become something different than what you were before. Let's run through that one more time, because people think it's backwards. They believe it's backwards. First you must believe, and then you do something because of what you believe. And then after you've done that thing, you become something different than what you were before. Does that make sense? Okay. Because there's a lot of people running around here calling themselves believers, and they don't believe not a single word. Everything they believe is a fairy tale, a fable. It's a made-up story. Everything that they believe. Literally, they've heard of a man who they call Jesus, and they believe that's his name. That's not his name, and he didn't do any of the things that you think he did, right? None of those things. So do they really believe in him? They call themselves believers, but they don't actually do anything to demonstrate what they believe. He said, if you love me. Okay, so this is a condition which requires you to do something. If you, if you love him, then keep his commandments. If you don't do that, then that just proves that you don't love him. Okay, if you think that he did away with the commandments, then that just proves that you don't know him. The scripture, give me verse 24. Scripture says, ye, ye see then how that by works a man is justified. Wait, how is a man justified? Okay, a man is justified by works, but what did they tell you? All the time. Not by works. It's not by works. I'm justified by my works and not by faith only. So me just saying that I believe in Jesus but not doing anything, that's a lot of faith but it's not enough to justify me. If I believe in him, I must do something. And once I've done something, I will become something different than what I was before. 
See, so there is a growing process that we talked about last night when we talked about being awake. Like most of us, it was really easy to become a Christian, wasn't it? Here you go. Hear me. Pick me. Pick me. Okay, here I am now. Bible. I don't have one of those. No, no, I got baptized and now I'm a Christian. <laughs> okay, it was really easy for you to become a Christian. It's going to be very difficult for you to become a disciple. Because a disciple is known by love. A disciple is able to exercise discipline. That means all the years that you've been spending learning this stuff, at some point you're going to have to put it to good use. You're going to have to prove that you can do it. So anybody here ever take like karate, kung fu, tai chi, taekwondo, anything like that? Little wrestling skills? What? A dullard knows a little headlock? What? Okay, you... So watch this. This is the crazy thing. You spend years practicing, breaking breaks, boom, taking tests, getting new belts. Them belts don't do nothing but hold up your pants. You don't know Kung Fu until you choose not to fight. I've been studying Tai Chi for many years. I didn't know Tai Chi until I was presented with the opportunity to fight. And the discipline told me I don't have to fight. I don't have to. Whether I win or lose, discipline tells you, you don't have to do this. Now, when I didn't have discipline, I was compelled. Oh, you, what you, you talking about my mama? Man, you talking about my, you stepped on my shoes? What, you looking at me crazy? All of these things we think are reasons to fight. That's because we don't have any discipline in our life. Now, I want you to imagine that you have been practicing for all this time and somebody feels like they're forcing you into a fight. It's only when you can control yourself with that discipline and say, I don't have to fight. Now you have mastered your work. That's what Kung Fu means, mastering work. Okay, I digress. Check this out. When you believe something, you will do something because of what? you believe all the decisions that you've made your whole life your decisions that you made today the decisions that you're going to make tomorrow they're all based on one thing what you believe does that make sense okay your entire thought process is controlled by what you believe everything in your life goes back to that everything you have everything that you're going to have all the people that you allow into your life when people try to speak into your life they want to mentor you, they want to coach you, they want to build you up or they want to tear you down. All those things are only possible based on what you believe. If someone says something terrible to you like, oh, what are you doing up there singing? You have a terrible voice. Sounds like the devil is in your throat. <laughs> and you believe them, you'll never sing again, ain't that right? Because you believed them. See, everything we do is based off of what we believe. But... The Bible tells you certain things that you're supposed to believe. And when you decide you don't believe those things, but you believe what everybody else says, then God is not your God, but other people's opinions, their values, they begin to become God for you. You bow down, you change the way you are, the way you respond. You do everything based on other people's opinions of you because you believe they are greater than you. That's why you would follow them. And when you do that, you also prove that you believe they're greater than God. But greater is he that is where? In you than he that is where? Okay, so we need to get this thing back in the proper perspective. Everything that you believe should be based on the Bible. Remember when you used to believe in um, the tooth fairy? You, you used to think some entity would actually take the time to break into your house in the middle of the night. They don't want your television. They don't want the stereo. What they want is your teeth. That's what you believed. Oh, the tooth fairy is coming tonight. I better leave these teeth under my... Kids believe that. Why do kids believe that? Because their parents have deceived them. The tooth fairy didn't deceive nobody. <laughs> People made this idea up. Remember when you believed that? Man... Today we're going to be asking three questions. Show them the first question. These three questions are going to help you to figure out what you believe so that you can make a solid answer and live according to your answer. The first one is, what do you believe God is? Notice how it's worded. It doesn't say who. It says what, right? What do you believe God is? Show them the second question. What do you believe you are? Not who what okay 
because what is related to your purpose? Like um, if I was going to nail something into this wall, what do I need? A hammer, but watch this. Who do I need? Simon, hook this up for me. bro. <laughs> so, so I know who to call. But see, listen, the thing is, what do you need in order to accomplish this thing? Show them the third question. What do you believe God wants from you? Once you can answer these three questions, you'll have a much better concept of what your purpose is. You'll also know how you can answer questions to people who ask you about your faith. Right? Let's get into that first one. Show them the first one again. What do you believe God is? Just answer to yourself. You're like, do you believe he's almighty? Do you believe he's just? Do you believe he's unfair, cruel? Do you believe he's sleeping? Do you believe that he's working all things together for your good? What do you believe God is? Go ahead. Anybody? Anybody want to share what they believe? What do you believe God is? No, nope, nobody wants to share. Okay, let me tell you what I believe God is. I believe God is love. Why do I believe that? Did I just what you got? God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. That's the scripture. I believe God is love. Did I just make that up? No? All right. Give me 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. See, I didn't have to make up. Well, I think God is a, is a very old guy who lives in the clouds, and every so often he causes it to rain when he's crying, and then whenever the devil is beating his wife, that's when the sun is out, but it's still raining. Remember all those crazy things we used to believe? <laughs> crazy stuff. You guys act like y'all never heard that. <laughs> God is love. Jump down to verse 16. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says, And we have known... There's our word and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So this is called, this is, um, this part is very complex, but this is the seed principle that when you have a seed, you physically have a seed, but you also have a tree because the tree is inside the seed and the seed comes out of the tree. It's the same way that it works when you're in God. God is also in you. So I believe that God is love. Now, am I representing God pro properly when I wake up and I'm angry and I just walk around and I'm cussing people out and I'm, I'm being very rude and disrespectful to people? Am I representing him properly if, if he's love and I'm not? Hmm. I also believe God is spirit. Give me John chapter 4, verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. Look at what Jesus says. He says, and they that worship him should worship him. <laughs> it says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Some precepts ought to be popping up right now. Somebody tell me. Because he said there's only one way to worship God because God is a spirit, capital S. If you believe that God is that spirit, then you also believe that there's only one way to worship him. What is that way? See, this is what's crazy. Spirit is one thing. Truth is another thing. But those two things are actually one thing. That's the reason why there's only one way to worship him. You can't just worship him in spirit. You have to worship him in, in spirit and in truth, and that is the way. How do we know that's the way? What's spirit? The words that Jesus speaks are spirit. And what's truth? The word that Jesus speaks, the law, all of that. See, those two things are actually one thing. That's how we know that to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, this one word. So law and testimony are are one word. Spirit and truth are one word. And God, he basically commands that we worship him according to that one thing. That's what I believe that he is. I believe he's spirit. Now, some other people, they believe, I believe God is the universe. You do? You don't believe he created the universe? You believe he is the universe? Oh, so then everything that happens in your life is just 
random and it's all a coincidence yeah that's what happens and where are you going to find your purpose if god is the universe oh i better get on this plane i better get on this jet i need to get into the universe so i can talk to god and figure out what my purpose is no god is love god is a spirit I must worship him in spirit and truth. Well, if both spirit and truth are the word, then I don't need a rocket to go somewhere. All I need is this word right here and the spirit to guide me through it. Show him number two. If God is love, and he is, and he is a spirit, this part should be pretty clear. What do you believe you are? I'm a gangster. No, you're not. You're stupid. <laughs> no, you're not. What do you, what do you think? You're a gangster? What are you? What do you believe you are? Whose image were you made in? Well, now that you know that God is love and he's a spirit, what are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be love. And you're supposed to be a spirit. Are you supposed to be flesh? You're not supposed to be running around here in the flesh. Don't put no confidence in the flesh. The flesh profiteth nothing. Now watch this. I believe that God makes me like him. So I believe that I am love. That's what I'm supposed to be every day when I wake up. I'm both loving, which means I love you, and I'm lovable, which means I allow you to love me. This is absolutely crucial because some people are so angry, they're not lovable. They're pushing you away. Their heart is like in a box, a plexiglass box, and they don't let nobody touch it, and they never let anything out of their heart onto other people. That don't sound like love. Give me 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. This is what I believe I am. The scripture says, in this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now, watch this. Notice that there's a couple words, and these words are exclusive. They are excluding a group of people. I'm going to read it again. It says, in this was, the, in this was manifested the love of God toward everybody. Everybody is inclusive. That includes everybody. It doesn't say that, does it? It says toward us. We've excluded everybody else. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that everybody... Nope, see, that would include everybody. It doesn't say that. It says that we might live through him. So everyone is not going to live through him, but we are. That's how he demonstrated his love. He gave us the opportunity to live through him. Yes, everyone has the opportunity, but that doesn't mean everybody takes it. All right? Give me verse 10. The scripture says, herein is love. That means this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Okay, so what happened first? You just wake up and be like, you know, I think I love God. No, the fact that you woke up proved that he loved you first. <laughs> because if he didn't love you, you wouldn't have woken up. You would have died in your sin, but he allowed you to wake up and have another breath so that you could repent. It says, herein is love. This is how you know it's love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11. Now here's our part right here. Beloved, that's you. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. What does that mean? If God is love, what are you supposed to be? You are supposed to, every time you have the opportunity to demonstrate love, you need to let go of the resentment, let go of the gossip, the backbiting, the hatred, the uh, looking out for number one. And you need to just be like, I don't, I think Jesus would do this. And then you do that thing. Now you can't do what he would do unless you know him, unless you read about his word to find out what he would do. That's how he is our example. Amen. Watch what he said, because when you are love, it allows you to do this thing. Love your enemies. You can't do that if you're not love. And Jesus proves it. Watch. Give me Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Verse 44. 
But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Let's pause there for a second. If any of that sounds difficult to you, you are not walking in the light. You are still in darkness even at this very moment. If you can run through your mind and find some person that is the exception to what Christ said, you're like, man, I can do that except for with this person right here. I ain't never forgiven them. I can't stand. You find that one person that you can't forgive and love even though they're considered your enemy. And at that very moment, everything is dark around you. And the light that you thought was light inside of you actually is darkness. This is how you'll know if you have discipline because you're presented with a task and you have the discipline to carry out the task. The rest of the world does not have this. They don't have the ability to love their enemies. This is something that Christ gave to us. He demonstrated this, right? So that we could become this. Now give me verse 45. He says that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. See, when you love your enemies, that demonstrates that you are the children of the most high. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Is he partial? You know, I really love you. Let me sprinkle a little rain on you. But you, I can't stand you. I'm going to put that Arizona heat on you. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This is the reason why sometimes wicked people get blessings. And you're like, where did you get that blessing from? Because God is not partial. God is not partial. All of that is grace. <coughs> Show me the question again real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it says, what do you believe you are? I was... Um, went from probably age zero to around age 19 or 20. And I thought I was a crayon in a box. I thought I was black. <laughs> What's black? What's black? Black is a color. It's a crayon in a box. That's what I thought I was. And people would ask me, so what are you? And I would be just dumb as, uh, just dumb as a crayon in a box. I would tell them, yeah, I'm black. <laughs> And then I'd say, what are you? And they were dumb too. They'd say, I'm white. And I'm like, oh, we're just both crayons in a box. That's really silly, isn't it? But I believe that's what I was for a long time. Man, I don't find that in the scriptures. Why did I believe that I was just a color? You reduced me to a color and made me believe it and said, well, I am a human and you are just a color. Therefore, I can be racist against you because I'm a human. You're not human. You're, you're, you're just a color. I believed that for a long time. So watch this. Some people who've had um, addictions, they believe that they are addicts. You know how long you're an addict for? For as long as you believe that you are an addict. Now, this is the part in AA that does not work. Because what happens? You come up to the podium. <laughs> it's time for you to make your presentation. You're like, hi, my name is Prophet, and I am an addict. What? You haven't touched it for 20 years. You have no desire to do it anymore. Why are you still identifying with the old man? Why, why would you want to proclaim that about yourself? How can you can't be a new creature like the scripture says? Nope, nope, you can't be new. You need to still be whatever it is that you've done. I'm not what I've done. I am whatever God says I am. So what does that mean? If I'm obedient, it means I am what I believe I am. So I believe I'm forgiven. Anybody here else believe that? Like you've done some stuff in your life and you're like, man, there is no way I would be standing here at this very moment. Unless I had been forgiven, I would have been struck down by lightning. Right? Bulls would have ran through the room and trampled me into pieces because I've done a whole lot of wicked stuff. But what do I believe? See, I'm bringing this up because there are a lot of people who say this. I'm just a sinner. <laughs> That's dumb. You sound like a crayon in a box. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, that's what you were before. You've been following Christ for 15 years and you're still a sinner? Well, then that religion doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I am forgiven and I am a child of God. 
Now watch this. Is the sinner a child of God? Absolutely not. The scripture says the sinner is not a child of God. When we repent, we are no longer sinners. That gives us the opportunity to be the children of God. Now let me show you what the scripture says. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 says, I write unto you little children because your sins are what? You need to believe that your sins are forgiven. It will allow you to stop being guilty when you wake up. It will allow you to stop holding yourself to a standard that you have never been able to measure up to. Start holding yourself to the standard that Christ has created, and you'll be able to measure up to it if you believe and you love God. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. What is his name? You got to see how this part works. Why are your sins forgiven you? For his name's sake. For anything that you did? No, for his name's sake. If my sins were not forgiven me, then he wouldn't be able to be called Yahweh Shai. Because what does that mean? It means salvation. The fact that my sins are forgiven is the fulfillment in the, of the prophecy. Give me Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. <clears throat> Let me show you guys real quick. Matthew chapter 1, and then we're coming right back to this. Like it says, And she shall bear, <clears throat> bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Yahweh Shai, Jesus in English, for he shall save his people from their sins. Do you believe that? You can't believe this and be run around saying that you're just a sinner saved by grace. Because what is it? Are you a sinner or are you saved from your sins? You're saved from your sins for his name's sake because his name means salvation. Take me back. First John chapter 2 verse. No, no, you know what? Give me Psalms chapter 103 verse 12. And this is another reason why I believe that I'm forgiven. I want you to believe that you are forgiven too. Some of y'all are real hard on yourselves. Stuff that you repented from, but you just can't let go because you, you still feel guilty. The scripture says, as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? It's, it's impossible for you to even calculate how far that is. Right? As from one end of the earth, look at what the scripture proves. From one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. How can we use that language all the time? You guys know a, a, a globe, a sphere has no end, right? But a plane has an end and an end. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Amen. That's why I believe that I'm forgiven. Give me 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let's find out how it is that you got to be forgiven. What it is that took place. Because if you believe that you're forgiven, then you should do something to demonstrate what you believe. The scripture says, if we confess, what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to confess. You'd be like, bro, I screwed up. I messed that whole thing up. I don't want to continue in this messed up state. I want to be forgiven for what I've done. So I'm going to confess it and I'm not going to do it anymore. The scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, from all the wrong choices. That's what that means. He's going to cleanse you from all the wrong choices that you made. Give me verse 10, just one more in there. Give me, yeah, give me verse 10. I want you guys to see the opposite of this. If we say that we have not sinned, <laughs> we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, let's take a look at that. If we say that we have not, who says they have not sinned? You would think nobody says that. Yeah, the majority of Christianity says that. Because what do they say? The law is done away with. If the law is done away with, then what happened to sin? There's no more sin. Now watch, we're going we're gonna to precept these two verses together so you can see how people are saying that even when they're not aware. They're making him a liar. The scripture says, if we say that we have not sinned, 
Give me 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. If we say that we have not sinned, so then we say, well, what is a sin? The scripture says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. That's how they say, well, we have not sinned. We haven't broken any law because the law's done away with. For sin is the transgression of the law. That is never going to change. So for as long as there is sin in the world, there's going to be a law that tells you what sin is. Now take me back to the first John. The verse 9, though. First John chapter 1, verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 10. So it says, <clears throat> If we say that we have not sinned, that's like saying if we say that the law is done away with, if we say we don't have to keep the commandments, if we say we don't have to be obedient, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See how cl crystal clear that is now? Because if the word was in you, you would be obedient. You would keep the commandments. You would know you still have to do the things that are pleasing to him. All right, it's time to dive deep now. If I am made in his image and I am a child of God and I believe that, then I'm supposed to do certain things. Give me 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Herein, now we read this, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have, what's that word? I want you to hold that word in your mind because there's something that you're supposed to have because you are something. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What are you supposed to have in the day of judgment? Boldness. What is? That? Why would you have boldness? Because you believed what he said. See, okay, the Bible clearly says that there's going to be seven trumpets, right? Seven vials blowing out. There's going to be um, fallen angels coming up out of the bottomless pit. There's going to be three and a half years of tribulation. The Bible says all of that. How come we don't live like we believe it? Now, not only does it say that to us, but it also says that to everyone who opens it and reads it. The message doesn't change. But we're just like them if we don't live like we believe it. Because when you believe something, then you do something. And after you've done that thing, you become something different than what you were before because of what you've done. We talked about that in the beginning. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Here it is. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That's how we're supposed to live. That's what we're supposed to do. Be like Christ in every possible way. And he gave us an example so that we could be like him. Give me 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. This ought to sound familiar because this was a part of last night's message. I like to tie in our Fridays with our Saturdays when at all possible, so that as you read the scriptures, it's becoming more and more familiar to you and you're able to explain it. Okay, so there's something that's gonna happen. When you're like him, you're gonna have some boldness. That Holy Ghost is going to give you the boldness. That's one of the evidences of having the Holy Spirit. You're no longer timid when it comes to the things that you believe. The Holy Spirit is going to give you boldness. You're like, uh-uh, no, that's fake right there. That's fake. I know because, and then you'll start spitting out scriptures, and you're like, I didn't even, I didn't even know where that scripture was located. It just rolled off my tongue. It was crazy, and it happened to be the right one. The scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, this is very important. Does the scripture say that the world knows him? No, nope, the world doesn't know him. Does the world know you? Does the world know that you are the sons and daughters of God? Nope. How could they possibly? Because you're doing everything like the son of God did, and they think you are strange. You go to church on Saturday? You go out to the woods for a whole week and you just live out there. What about your job? What about the kingdom? How about that? <laughs> what about where I'm going to live forever? You trying to tell me about my weekly paycheck. I'm good if I take a week off work because I've per, per, 
per oh prepared. I've prepared for it. I've planned for it. Now watch. Give me verse two. The scripture says, "Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be." It doesn't look like we're the sons of God, but I. I promise you, you are doing everything that the Son of God did. Scripture says, But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, other people, they can't see him how he is. They see a false image. They see the image. It's not the real salvation. They see a false salvation. They get their false salvation now. Our salvation doesn't come until he who is salvation comes back to give it to us. Watch this. Give me. We're going into the Apocrypha. This is Wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 5, verse 1. Because the revelation of Christ and your salvation is a story in the scriptures. This is what it says. Then shall the righteous man stand in great. What's that word? Boldness. Okay, that's the boldness in the day of judgment. Before the face of such as have afflicted him. Who's he standing in front of? His oppressors, his captors, those that hated him and afflicted him. He's standing in front of him. And how does he how's he look? He's bold. You know why? He looks over here, and there's Yahweh Shai standing there. Can you be any more bold except for the time when you're standing in the presence of God? You're like, told you, I told you. I'm going to throw up one of those. Phil go. Boom. I'm like, I see you there. You didn't, you didn't believe. It's Jesus. I'm with him. I'm on this side. You're on that side. That's great boldness. <laughs> All right. Now watch this. Then shall the righteous man stand in great boldness before the face of such as have afflicted him and made no account of his labors. What's another word for labor? See, they thought you was doing all that stuff for no reason. Man, I ain't got to do no work. All I got to do is have faith. You made no account of the work that we put in so that we could stand here with Jesus. Because faith without works is, okay, now watch this. When they see it, they shall be troubled with terrible fear and shall be amazed at the strangeness of his salvation. They're literally standing over there going, um, what is Mike Waddle doing over there with Jesus? How come I'm here with all the people that I know? <laughs> Man, I know all of y'all. It's weird. Why is he over there? That's strange. You need to be over here with us. And then they'll remember, well, he, he didn't go to church with us. He didn't celebrate. He didn't worship on the same day that we did. He, he didn't eat the same food that we did. He didn't celebrate none of those fake holidays that we've been celebrating. They're going to start to realize it, and that's going to terrify them. The fact that the way that you lived your life was so different than them when they see you standing with Christ. Watch what it says. When they see it, they shall be troubled with terrible fear and shall be amazed at the strangeness of his salvation. So far beyond all that they looked for. Give me the next verse. Verse 3. Now, they're in the, they're, they're in the fire. Scripture says, and they repenting, it's too late to repent now. <laughs> now you're making promises. Lord, if you just get me out this fire, I will do everything you say. And they, it says, and they repenting and groaning for anguish of spirit shall say within themselves, this was he whom we had sometimes in derision. What does that word derision mean? You guys got to see this. This is the actual judgment. And all the sinners are standing together and they're realizing that they, they made the wrong choice. But they're pointing at you and they're saying, it's strange that he's saved. I never thought he would have been saved except for the fact that he did everything different than the way that I did it. And this is the same guy that we used to laugh at. We used to mock him. We used to talk bad about him. That's what derision means. We had him in derision. Watch, it says, and a proverb of reproach. Does that, does that pull a precept for anybody? They're looking at you and they're saying, this is the guy that we called bad names. 
And then they're going to find out that they did that according to the scriptures. Watch. Give me Deuteronomy. Hold that. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 37. Because the curses <clears throat> on the children of Israel is that you would be this thing that they're calling. Deuteronomy. You got it? 28, 37. The scripture says, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whether Yahweh shall lead thee. So they're looking at you now and they're saying, man, we used to call this guy the N-word. We used to say terrible things about this guy. Why is he over there with Jesus? Verse 4 says, we fools, what does a fool say? The fool says there is no God. We fools accounted his life madness. We thought he was crazy for doing all that stuff. <laughs> and his end to be without honor. Okay. Give me this last selection. Give me verse five. Now they're scratching their heads and they're saying, um, how is he numbered among the children of God? <laughs> and his lot is among the saints. How did he get over there with the children of God? Therefore, have we erred from the way of truth? Now they're realizing it. They're in the flames, right? They're gnashing their teeth, but they can see you. You guys know this is the story of so-called Abraham's bosom. We know we can see them and they can see us, right? And they're scratching their head and they're saying, wait a minute. Why is he over there? And I'm here tormented in the flame. And then all of a sudden they realize we erred from the way of truth. And the, what's that word? And the light of righteousness hath not shined unto us. And the sun of righteousness rose not upon us. Wow. Verse 7. We wearied ourselves in the way of wickedness and destruction. Yeah, we have gone through deserts. Now they're realizing that all of their evangelizing. We have gone through deserts. Everywhere that they built churches when they, when they didn't tell people the truth, we have gone through deserts where there lay no way. That means they put houses here and they put churches there. And give me Matthew, hold that. Give me Matthew 23, verse 15, because Jesus prophesied that people would do this exact thing. Matthew 23, 15 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. What are they? Hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You go everywhere you can possibly go. You will travel overseas. You will build churches in the craziest of places so that you can make one fake disciple. And when you've made him, he is twice the child of hell that you are. It doesn't say twice the child of God, the child of hell. Now take me back to the wisdom of Solomon so we can see how that was prophesied. It says, we have wearied ourselves in the way of wickedness and destruction. Yeah, we have gone through deserts where there lay no way. But as for the way of the Lord, we have not known it. That's when they realize when they're in the flames and they see how strange it is that you receive salvation. That's when they realize that they have made an error. These people who believe what they believe, unless the Holy Spirit opens up their eyes and their understanding and you begin to teach them the truth, they're going to keep believing in the falseness all the way to the fire. Only once they're in it are their eyes going to be awakened. Show them question number three. <laughs> This is what it really comes down to right here. This, we already talked about who we believe God is. We talked about who we believe we are. We believe we're the children of God. Okay, so what do you believe God wants from you? We already know. We covered this every single time we stand behind this podium. We talk about this. So I'm just going to give you some precepts so that you are able to prove it for other people. Okay? <clears throat> John 14, 15. Scripture says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. What does God want from you? See, I believe that God wants me to do two things. To keep his commandments and to love other people as Jesus loved me. 
That's what I believe. That's why I do what I do. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 11. Deuteronomy 7, 11. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. I believe he wants me to do them. What you guys know when it says this day, that's still today, right? When you read that tomorrow, will you be able to say, he wanted me to do that yesterday. Today is a whole new day. You don't get to say that. It's still going to be the same day that he wants you to keep the commandments. John 14, 21. <clears throat> John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. See, I believe he wants me to keep the command. What you got? That's right. That is extremely powerful. So <clears throat> manifest means to to bring into existence or to cause to be visible. The word revelation has to do with manifestation, right? Because there's some stuff that people can't see until it manifests in the physical. He says, he that hath my commandments, that's all of you, and keepeth them, that's all of you. He it is that loveth me, that's all of you, you love him. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. Okay, so because you kept the commandments, you did something. And when you did something, you became something different than what you were before. See, the father loves you now. And because the father loves you, it says, and I will love him. Now Christ loves you also and will manifest myself to him. It means he's going to make himself known to you. Man. Same chapter. Give me verse 23. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. I, you guys, I did not write the Bible. <laughs> Sometimes we cover so many verses about commandments that people think, you, they use a whole different Bible over there at Prophecy. For some reason, their Bible talks only about commandments. I don't know why. When I go home, I can't find none of those verses. Because you're looking in Psalms. <laughs> you're trying to read the Psalms. Get down into this, this gospel. The scripture says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Where's that going to be at? That's the kingdom of God. When both the father and the son come and they live here on earth amongst us. Let's see the flip side of that. Give me verse 24. <clears throat> Scripture says, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. <laughs> and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Okay, that's for those people who are like, I don't read the Old Testament. I only read the New Testament. You're not going to find something in the New Testament that's not referenced in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, don't show it. Don't show it. Just think about it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. What does it say? Don't show it. What does it say? Off top. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's your part? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty. Now show it to him real quick. That's pretty good. You guys was going back and forth like kid and play, right? Like run DMC, going back and forth. Look, <clears throat> let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. You don't have no purpose outside of fearing God and keep his commandments. I got one more verse for you, then we're going to break. Let's run back through the questions one more time. Three questions. Question number one. This is what it looked like. What do you believe God is? I believe God is love. I believe he is a spirit. I believe I must worship him in spirit and in truth. Question number two. What do you believe you are? I believe I am forgiven. I believe that I am the child of the most high God. I am an heir to the throne. Question number three. What do you believe God wants from you? 
What's the answer to that? He wants you to keep his commandments. There's one other thing. Give me John chapter 13, verse 34. Scripture says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. This part is very crucial. These are the two commandments. On these two things hang all the law and the prophets. Love God and love his people. Amen? This is the message I have for you today.